Hi, everybody. We all know what happened in East Palestine, Ohio, on February 3rd, the train derailment, Norfolk Southern. We know a lot of the facts about what happened, but as with anything else, it's the human dimension that matters most. So I received an email recently from my guest today, Erica Wallace. Erica is married with a two-and-a-half-year-old little boy. She lives 10 miles away from uh, the scene of the accident, scene of this horrible, really, uh, catastrophic event, not only for the land, not only for the environment, but for people. And so when Erica wrote me and she asked if we could talk, I thought, wow, I want everybody to hear what Erica has to say. So Erica, thank you so much for being with me. I'm really hey. grateful. Of course, yeah. There are a lot of people who want to know the story. Uh, you were telling me about your parents uh, living four miles away, your own 10-mile uh, uh, distance from the mm -hmm. um, train derailment. But just start telling us what happened and what's been the experience, not only for you and your parents, but for uh, other people who are in the area, and what are your concerns. So I'm just going to throw it over to you. Um, okay. Tell us, as a person who is there, what's all this been about for you? Um, so just like starting at the beginning, um, I found out about it because my mom sent me a picture from their driveway, and you could see the the fire and the smoke and it was just like this big orange glow and I was like oh my gosh like what happened you know thinking I, I guess I didn't know what to think necessarily was that that night mm -hmm. yeah uh -huh. that was like the initial derailment it wasn't it was before the controlled burn control burn yeah um so you know immediately I went outside to see if we could see it, but we weren't able to see the glow or anything. Cause I mean, there's this pretty hilly up here and we live kind of behind this big hill. So we were mm -hmm. we weren't able to see anything. Mm -hmm. Um, but everybody on Facebook was posting all of these pictures. Like we have a lot of people that we know, um, you know, family, people we went to high school with, stuff like that, that live in East Palestine, like very, very close. Like for instance, um, my uncle lives about a half a mile from there. He's also <laughs> on the Pennsylvania side of things. Mm -hmm. So there, I think there was just like a lot of panic because mm -hmm. it derailed pretty close to an oil company, like a gas station oil company. So the initial kind of panic was that it was going to catch the gas station on fire right. and the gas station right. was going to explode. So right. everybody was kind of panicked. There was a lot of misinformation. There was, mm -hmm. um, you know, how the rumor mill kind of goes and that you heard that it was the gas station that the train hit into or yes, like there were oil tankers that were sitting there that exploded. Like all of these things were kind of flying around before anybody really knew what happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every fire department from around here, like, I can't remember how many I know, I know there was a lot that responded and were trying to, you know, use water or whatever they could to help keep it from spreading. But it was so cold that the water was actually freezing while they were trying to get it, you know, from the tankers to where they needed it to be and when they were gonna get the tankers refilled. Um, they there was just a lot of panic because it was in the single digits so everything was freezing um you know and then come the next day that's when the question of like what was on the train you know once it kind of came to light that the gas station wasn't what exploded then it it brought up okay well what was on the train that could make that big of an impact you know mm -hmm. with the fire and everything mm -hmm. And um, then, it, you know, it came out that they were going to do the controlled burn. They were evacuating people. Um, like, I think, I think the National Guard was out here. They, they had a lot of the main roads and the side roads blocked off. You couldn't get in. Um, there were a lot of people that were panicking because, you know, they had left that the night before or whatever. And... Now they're being told that they can't go back. Can't get back to their homes. Yeah. And like we have 
um, some people we went to high school with, and I actually have a cousin that lives there, and they were panicking because they left their animals at home. Yeah, I was and just thinking that people. Who yeah, they weren't allowed to go back in to get their animals, and they didn't. They weren't told when they were going to be able to get back in. I think that right. was like a, a big part of the panic and the anger, I guess, because you weren't even able to get back to your own property to to save your animals. There were people trying to, you know, evacuate their horses, evacuate their dogs, their cats, like all of that. And there was a lot of panic, I think is the only word that can come to mind, you know, when you're trying to get everybody out or when you left, you didn't take anything with you, you know, you took the clothes on your back, you didn't right, take anything. Right. So, um, the controlled burn, we were able to see not from directly at our house. We, we had to go up the road, probably a quarter of a mile or so to kind of get to the top <clears throat> of our little ravine that we live in. And we were able to see the huge mushroom plume of smoke and you can, you could see where it was passing, you know, it was kind of blowing but it didn't disperse the way they thought it was going to, or the way they at least told everybody that it was going to, because the temperature dropped and then it started to rain. So then everybody started panicking about acid rain and, you know, is this going to burn our skin? Is it going to peel the paint off of our cars? Like we had no idea. And then we didn't know exactly how far of a distance necessarily that it was in the atmosphere before it did start to rain. So, I mean, there were people that are like 50 miles from here that were kind of concerned, but you know, Norfolk Southern just kept saying that one or two mile radius in East Palestine, as long as you get out of there, you're totally fine. And, um, now, did they have spokesmen on the ground at that time, or were they just emailing you, or how did you get that information from North? I think Southern? I think they did have people on the ground, um, like kind of facilitating the the controlled explosion, mm -hmm. um, and that's just they were going around house to house, like when they were Telling evacuating people. people. That's kind of when everybody found out what was going to happen, and then the word just spread through people calling and texting and seeing things on Facebook. And I mean, that's obviously where a lot of miscommunication came from. Mm -hmm. um, now we weren't able to smell anything here at our house. You're 10 miles away. Yes, but we were mm -hmm. in the opposite direction of where the wind was going when they did okay. that. It went directly over Darlington, Pennsylvania, which mm -hmm. is right up against East Palestine. Okay. Um, my uncle that lives about a half a mile from the site, his address is Darlington, PA. Okay. But like I said, he's, he's a stone's throw away from where that was. Mm -hmm. Um, like I said, my, my parents live about four miles away. My best friend lives about two miles from there and she has two little kids and mm -hmm. animals and everything. Um, my husband's family, they, his parents and his brother, they lived, I think it's like five and a half miles from it. They're also in Darlington. So it's just, I don't know. It was just, it was just very, very scary. And, you know, my mom said that like, she was able to smell it. She, it was kind of like messing with her, like up in her nose and everything like that. But she said that it was only for like a day or so. And then it went away where you couldn't smell it anymore. But then at that point it became, well, now it's in the ground. Now it's in the water. A lot of people have private wells here. You know, it's a very small, it's a small area, but it's, it's kind of like multiple little small towns that okay. all kind of butt up against each other. Mm -hmm. And that's when the question started happening of like people seeing dead fish, dead cats, you know, I think, I think one person in town of East Palestine, their, their dog died just suddenly the dead fish started popping up, dead frogs, dead salamanders, stuff like that. Again, they kept saying like, everything's <laughs> fine. Um, and I think one of the biggest kind of kickers, which is not funny, but it's, it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, it is ridiculous 
is, I think it was like less than three days or something or around three days after the train derailment happened, they had those tracks fixed and more trains were coming through. They buried everything. They buried all of that chemical. They buried all of the residue underneath the new tracks that they had put through. So I think, you know, that, that really got people in an uproar of you just buried it even further. That's basically guaranteeing, you know, decades of problems. And eventually they said, okay, we're, we're going to come in. I think it was the EPA that made them do that. That's what I was just going to ask you, because you've talked about how Norfolk Southern was there from the beginning. When did you begin to, you know, when was the government there? When was anybody from the EPA there? I mean, it was, it was pretty delayed. I don't know exactly when they showed up. Just like I said, there's been a lot of information kind of floating around everywhere, but I know for a fact that it was super delayed because that's, that's kind of been the consistent complaint that I'm seeing is that there was almost no response from anybody. Nobody there to like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they ended up, you know, there, they had to remove the track, take all of that dirt and remove it. I don't know exactly where you would take that dirt, you know, but um, they did that. And, and while they were digging that up, they again advised everybody within the one mile radius to move, um, to like temporarily move, to evacuate while they were doing that. Um, people were able to go back in. And then I now it's question. kind of... I want to ask a question that you might not know the answer to. Yeah. Were the workers who were doing all that digging, were they wearing some kind of protective garb, do you know? I'm not sure because at first, like with the, all the first responders when it initially happened, nobody was because nobody knew what was on the train. So it wasn't just assumed that it was chemical, mm -hmm. you know? So a lot mm -hmm. of the first responders and a lot of the first people, at least over the first like couple days, I don't think they were wearing anything. Now, when they came back out to, you know, dig up the track and remove that, I'm not sure if the EPA required, you know, any kind of um, face masks or, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. Like we were seeing people walking around, you know, with the big white science, yeah. Yeah, like, like hazmat suits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then you were also seeing people walking around with nothing. So it was just, ve it's, it was just weird. It was very confusing. Um, so now I guess the thing is I've seen a lot of meetings being held in the East Palestine high school. And there's a lot of people that are really, really upset for good reason. You know, property values are going to decline. Nobody's going to want to move there. And if, you know, if there are people that have the financial resources to be able to move out of that town, nobody's going to buy that house. You know what I mean? So it kind of puts you in like a weird spot where if you wanted to leave and were able to leave, you still are like kind of stuck because you'd still have that property and Lord knows if it would ever sell when and if, you know. Um, but I think, I think something that was really frustrating was Pennsylvania was just getting left out of it. You know, Norfolk Southern mm -hmm. never acknowledged that PA residents were also being affected by this. Like, well, from what you said, you're very, very close. Yes. Yeah. Your, your uncle, I think you said was half a mile mm -hmm. away, but he was in Pennsylvania. Yeah. But they were, only, you said it was it little, little towns that were butting up against each other. Was Norfolk Southern acting as though its only responsibility was to people in East Palestine? Yeah. Mm-hmm. How like my, um, uh, my uncle actually said like they were acting like there was some kind of invisible shield. Yeah. That well, went up. after, yeah. After East Palestine. Yeah. We don't mm -hmm. have any, we don't, we don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just the people that were having, you know, they, I'm pretty sure there were some people that had some like residue on their car and everyone was like testing their pool cover water, you know, like the water mm -hmm. on top of the pool cover to see what was going on with that. Um, th I mean, this is a big farming area. There is mm -hmm. a ton of, you know, crops and a lot of dairy farms. There's a lot of beef farms, stuff like that. 
And the question kind of is, is it going to be safe? You know, that, that industry is going to suffer because all the extra testing that they would have to do, or like, is it, would it even be safe to consume any of that? You know, the corn fields and I mean, there's soybean fields here and you know, those kind of go into everything. There's, there's soy in so many things. There's like wheat and I mean, I mean, there's, there's everything out here. So you've named three areas already where there's devastation due to this. First of mm -hmm. all, people's bodies, uh, yeah. animals have already died. So what's happening mm -hmm. to us medically? Second, house values, home values. If people even want to leave, then how are they going to sell their houses? Because who mm -hmm. wants right now to buy a house in East Palestine? And thirdly, it's an agricultural area. So who knows what's getting into those soybeans? What's getting into the wheat? What's getting into the mm -hmm. ground? So those are three major areas uh, right there. Mm -hmm. So just as we listen to you, for we can hear the multi-layered um, yeah. devastation. It's, so go on, keep talking. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this area is, a, it's, it's like such a cliche to say, but it's true that like everybody knows everybody here. Mm -hmm. And it's always like a joke where it's like, I, I can't go anywhere without my dad knowing somebody or... Yeah. You know, like my dad grew up here. He he spent his entire life here, and it, it's that way for a lot of families here, where it's multiple generations have lived here, have worked here, have done all of that. And there are a lot of small businesses in East Palestine, and I've you know we have seen that like they can't go back because you know their potentially their water was contaminated or like I know I know of a family friend who is currently pregnant and she has oh. a business in East Palestine and she had to close down for a while and I don't even know if she's actually open yet so or not where is she where are people going I there I mean people were staying with friends staying with families going to hotels you know stuff like that um I don't know exactly where she's staying. I just know that she had to close the business because she did, wasn't comfortable. She wasn't going to risk her body not. or anything, you know, so. going back there. So small businesses are going to suffer. And it's just kind of, I don't know. I know I'm 10 miles away from it. So I may necessarily, you know, be out of a danger zone per se, but it's just... What our entire family is here. All of our friends are here. You and know. So are they staying in that area? You're, you said your parents were four miles away. Yeah. You said your mother is. After a day, she couldn't smell anything, but that doesn't necessarily even mean that much. But yeah. your parents are in their home. Are they drinking the water? Has there been any? I mean, I want to know about the reaction of Norfolk Southern. I want to know about the reaction of the government, and I want to know how people have felt about the reaction of both of those. Uh, there was a lot of talk about the governor, DeWine, uh, testing the water. The EPA said the water was okay, but then we f we found that the tests were being paid for by Norfolk mm -hmm. Southern. Uh, what's going on on the ground? How people are experiencing? I know there had been one meeting, at the, I think at the high school, the mayor was complaining because Norfolk Southern wasn't there. As a person who lives in that area, what is your experience and the experience of your friends about number one, the reaction of Norfolk Southern, number two, the reaction of your state government, and number three, the reaction of the U.S. government? So the, the reaction of Norfolk Southern was basically, it seemed like they were bothered that they had to deal with this, you know, very kind of apprehensive to say anything. And I know there were meetings, you know, that were, and they ended up being uploaded to Facebook and everything. So a lot more people could see them. And there were residents that were asking direct questions to representatives of Norfolk Southern, you know, like, what are we going to do about the water and our air? And, you know, we may not know the consequences until 15 years from now, then what do we do? You know, all of and that what stuff. what did Norfolk Southern say? What did those pretty much nothing say? pretty much nothing that they were they would reference the water test that had been done or the air test the air quality test that had been done and they would say you know the water's fine the air's fine but then you hear of people saying like i can't even go outside or in my house even without feeling like i need to cover my face because the smell is so bad so there it was just like blatant you know miscommunication kind of 
intentionally like leaving out information. Um, they had these things like these um, blockers kind of in the, the nearby streams and rivers and stuff trying mm -hmm. to contain that water. Mm -hmm. So how can you say the water's safe, but you have like a full team <clears throat> out there trying to contain it, you know? Um, the Ohio, I know the Ohio governor, it was a delayed response also. He was saying, you know, that everything was testing within normal ranges. Everything was okay. You could go back home, stuff like that. People kind of knew that that wasn't true because they were the ones on the ground smelling things and seeing things and knew that it wasn't safe. Um, Pennsylvania government, there was like a slight delay, but I think there has been more of a response from the PA government than there was from the Ohio government. From what I've seen and what I've heard, it's very much like... I don't know. They're just not taking it. They're just not taking it seriously, you know. And then what about the EPA? What about U.S. government? What about Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg? What's been your experience of the U.S. government? So I think overall, the thing that I I keep seeing is people complaining that Biden hasn't responded. You know what I mean? There there hasn't really been any communication like from the White House at all. Um, that, that was like a big concern. So I think would, would people you were have upset. Wanted, I'm sorry, go would, ahead. Would it have helped people if the president had come? I, I think it would have made more of a statement to how serious it was, yeah. you know? So I guess to get, <laughs> to get people to take it more seriously, like yeah. if, if the president of the United States shows up you know, people pay more attention, you know what I mean? So rather than not that state government isn't important, but when a state representative shows up versus yeah. the president, it's a much yeah. bigger yeah. deal and it brings a lot more attention to the situation. So I know a lot of people around this whole area that were more just annoyed, angry, sad, that there was really not a lot of like, urgency to this right so it's now been over a month has the attention any attention you were getting which it doesn't sound like it was ever adequate how is it now has it whittled away even to less attention or do you feel they're working on it finally uh where are things right now so i know there have been a lot of meetings um with with um the government for darlington like the the local government here like the small the small town governments are, you know, meeting with residents, talking about things. There's, there are people that from outside of this area that are donating, you know, cases of water, um, stuff like that. There are some people that I'm pretty sure there's a water, uh, an independent water testing company that was trying to work with people on price wise of getting things done. So it's, it seems like it's more, the local community and the local government is trying to do things to help each other and help themselves out. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of support. Mastriano was here a few weeks ago. He was meeting with people um, at the local community college here. So he met with a lot of the residents, heard a lot of people out. I know specifically my uncle that lives the half a mile from the derailment site. I know he spent a good amount of time talking with him about different things. I don't know exactly what the goal was to get out of it or, you know, what the plan is, I guess, on on his end of it. But it, he, he did show up, <laughs> did talk to people. He was trying to, like, I, at least, like, bring awareness to it and see what people needed, what people were upset about, like, you know, and they, they talked about Norfolk Southern and the, the lack of urgency and compassion and just, <clears throat> you know, a human response to all of this. So, um, so I'm not quite questions. sure what he has going on on his mm -hmm. end. 
I have two questions. First of all, has there been any conversation about some huge class action suit, something that you're going to do, the town, the residents of the town and the surrounding areas to sue Norfolk uh, Southern for appropriate remuneration, medical care, et cetera, in the years going forward? Mm -hmm. Is there any conversation about that? Yeah, there, there are a lot of people that are using the same attorneys mm -hmm. to kind of condense it so it's it's not so spread out where right one big know, thing yeah so i know i know there's a lot of people that are involved in lawsuits like specifically for um extended like medical testing right um because we have no all of these things are cancer causing and and they affect your respiratory system so um there's a lot of people that are saying you know, extended medical testing is what they want they want um, just basically suing for damages or like your, <clears throat> what is it like the emotional damage, the mental damage that, that happened through all of this. I know there's some people that are including, you know, the property values going down that You're they right. need to be responsible for that. You're absolutely right. And, Let me ask you a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. No, that's okay. Go ahead. Is there anger? and realization of all the deregulation that the train company in terms for instance the antiquated brake system all of the dangers that workers had warned about mm -hmm. um all of the ways in which the uh railroad company in order to save money uh created a situation in which this was more um more probable if not even inevitable is there that kind of realization on a kind of political level that this only happened because so that this railroad company could make more money i don't know on the on the political level i know i know just with the community here we all know that it it could have been avoided had they not tried to cut corners and okay That's um, what i wanted to know the train was way longer than it should have been that's exactly right it also had an outdated um, braking system on it. That's right. And but people do realize all of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, there's a lot of anger surrounding that because mm -hmm. it's like their Norfolk Southern's negligence is now up uprooted and caused all of this for such a small area that a lot of people don't have the means to just up and relocate, nor should they have to. I think that's, no, that's the biggest correct. thing also is even if you have the money to leave, you shouldn't have to leave. And that's, that's kind of what I had mentioned to you before where, mm -hmm. you know, we're 10 miles from it. We have all of our family and friends here. There, there are people with underlying health issues, right. you know, that this is kind of going to be, you know, amplified right. with them. And, and, you know, my, my mom, I had mentioned she's four miles away. She has MS. We don't know how this is going to affect her MS. Um, my son specifically has a, a really rare genetic disorder and we have no idea. It, one of the, he's immune compromised. Um, he's epileptic uh, among other things, but we don't know are we far enough away that this isn't going to have an effect on him if we visit his grandparents is this going to have an effect on him you know how is it going to affect my mom how is it going to everybody that you know all the women that are currently pregnant like anybody that has an underlying condition like this is going to potentially like really aggravate them you know health speaking health wise speaking where your average healthy person may be okay. You know, who knows? 15 years from now, they could have cancer or whatever. But I think the people with the underlying conditions, I think this is going to be something that you see more of a result with them sooner than you would. Yeah. You know, and I mean, there's a lot of elderly people here. <laughs> there is just <clears throat> a massive mix of ages and like like i said just like the the medical diversity here i mean there's so many people that have underlying conditions and right like I, like my husband and i have kind of talked about like do we wait around to see if this creates more complications for our son or do we try to figure out a way to leave so that we can avoid any potential 
issues. You know what I mean? He's, right. He spends a lot of time in the hospital and with specialists as is, and we don't need or want or it's we're very scared that this is going to kind of bring something else on top of what we're already dealing with. Do you have adequate medical insurance? Yes. Luckily, mm -hmm. yeah, luckily we do. <clears throat> a, a lot of people don't, you know. Erin Brockovich was in East Palestine speaking. Did you go hear her? No, I didn't. They they limited that to East Palestine residents, and there was only um, X amount of people that were allowed to to be there because they were trying to not. <laughs> I wonder make why. It. Who was it who said that more people couldn't hear her? I'm not sure. It it mm -hmm. they were trying to avoid it becoming like a circus where people just wanted yeah, to show damn up. Yeah, damn right. They were trying to avoid enough people, you know, yeah. to really make a difference hearing what she had to say is what it was. Yeah, I know. I know. Sometimes some people were like, "You don't need to come to this meeting if you're just trying to be in the next Aaron Brockovich movie." You know, like, stay away if you don't actually live here, if you don't actually have real concerns, you know, stuff like that. They just tried to limit it so that it wasn't, like I said, a circus. They didn't want well, a big mess, I guess. Well, but like you were saying, people in Pennsylvania, there were a lot of surrounding areas, not just East Palestine, where people's lives are being affected. I hope mm -hmm. you realize, and, and all of the people I'm sure they realize, that um, Norfolk Southern was distributing $7.5 billion to its stockholders. I mean, this is a very wealthy com company. Yeah, I think, and I I think hope total they're going to sue the hell out of them. They're worth over $50 billion, yeah, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's like my thought process where it's, this is a small area. There are a lot of people here, but they could equally, you know, distribute some funds, whether it's to That's right, honey. help you move or for medical expenses or what, whatever you wanted to use that money for to try to get yourself out of whatever specific situation, and like that, personally. That money should be available for any kind of medical possibilities that might arise for years mm -hmm. to come. There's a man named David Sirota, S-I-R-O-T-A, who's written not only about what did happen, but what should happen. And mm -hmm. I um, I will make sure you, know, you, you see that and we'll post it when we're talking. Mm -hmm. um, this is really helpful, Erica. What are, what are the th things that you most, and, and I know that your desires here are shared by so many people in the area, what do you want people to know? And what would you be, I mean, you've shared many of your concerns. Um, what would you uh, want all of us to know? And what would you want done? I, know, I mean, we're in agreement here. Norfolk Southern should be yeah. handling all of these difficulties and they should be uh, held accountable. But it does sound like there are lawyers who are working together. Mm -hmm. There's gonna, you, you do feel there's some action there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you feel like y'all are coming together as citizens to hold Norfolk Southern accountable. What about the U.S. Yeah. government, though? Do you think it's there? Do you think EPA is helping at this point? Or do you feel that it's all just sort of drifting away from everybody's attention? I, th I feel like it's it's something that the government and especially Norfolk Southern obviously are just trying to make it go away and kind of sweep it under the rug like it didn't happen where it and and I think a, I have I have seen where some people are saying you know just because we're a small town just because you know we there's not a lot here. It is a farming town, stuff like that. It's doesn't mean we don't matter. It doesn't mean all of these people don't matter just because right. you think like, oh, it's just a small area, you know, who cares? And they try to sweep it under the rug. It's that's kind of like the vibe where it just seems like, I don't know. It's just like they want it to go away and there's not any urgency under here. It's kind of like, well, the fire's out, we took the dirt out of the, you know, we removed the dirt, and we tested the air, we tested the water, it came back fine, so you guys are good. That's kind of where it is. So it really is the community kind of, everybody kind of coming together. There's new Facebook groups now for, you know, people in Darlington, people in um, South Beaver Township, people in Eden Valley, Pennsylvania, you know, like there, there's everybody's kind of coming together with their individual mm -hmm. community to try to mm -hmm. figure out how they can get the most help 
and and mm -hmm. what that necessarily means whether that's you know whether they're focusing on the well testing and getting water donations things like that or if they're focusing on i know some people um had offered up some boarding services for like horses and cows and you know things like that to try to just get them a little bit further away from the situation mm -hmm. so it's really more like <clears throat> the community is taking care of the community. It's, it's not really like we're getting a ton of support or resources necessarily from the government. So I'd like to come if you would introduce me, if we could, could we find a high school or someplace where I could go oh, and yeah, yeah, meet absolutely. with people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd love to hear more and more stories. And then if I have those stories and I understand more deeply what's happening, then I certainly uh, would love to use my campaign as a way to amplify uh, what's going on there, uh, keep it in people's um, minds and attention mm -hmm. and really inform people as you just did in some really wonderful ways. I can't thank you enough. Uh, you informed a lot of people just now what's needed, what the dangers are, what's mm -hmm. needed and what the human experience is. And um, I appreciate it so much. Is there yeah, anything else that you'd like to tell me or tell people uh, about what's going on there and what you what words you want to get out to people? I just think the biggest thing is, you know, just as a whole, everybody's trying to make sure that this doesn't get forgotten because the news coverage wasn't great on it, you know, from the get go. And as time passes, you know, and then and then there's more things that kind of grab the attention of the media you, you know, mm -hmm. elsewhere, like other disasters or, you know, like weather events or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. it may be, kind of, <clears throat> nobody really wants this to have its 15 minutes of fame and then just go away like it never happened right. because this is something that everybody here is going to be dealing with for a really long time and we don't, nobody knows what we're necessarily going to be dealing with. We don't. You can't really anticipate it. You can't plan for it because you don't know exactly what's going to happen. And I think if you just think about it, like if your family was here, how would you want people to respond? And how would you want, like in what ways would you want to receive help versus, you know, just kind of getting a blanket statement and, and being told basically this is what it is. Yeah. Well, your sharing was very touching, and I know a lot of people are sort of receiving the news about East Palestine at a deeper level because they heard you. So you served your community today, and you served okay, all I of us. So. <laughs> yeah, you did, and I look forward to seeing you in East Palestine. We will be in touch. I'll be there. Uh, I would be honored if you would introduce me, and we could sort of have a conversation together, uh, and I could hear from more okay. people. Yeah. Um, and uh, all of us will just do whatever we can. Uh, to be of service to you and to okay. those you love at a time like this. And I send you uh, all my love and all my, all oh, my best you. wishes. But even more importantly, I think everybody is listening right now uh, is feeling the same way. Good. All right. So we started a conversation. You yeah. and I did not end a conversation just now. I'm going to see you in East Palestine. Okay. All right. Okay, Thank Donna. you. Thanks.